Happy Easter, Calvary. It's wonderful to be with you on this Easter Sunday. Christ is risen. He's risen indeed. As we prepare for Easter worship, I hope you and those you are worshiping with this morning, whether that be in the comfort of your own home or maybe online with us here, and we are your community, I wish you the happiest of Easter blessings. As we prepare for the coming weeks, there are a few announcements for our community that I just want to make sure you have especially as we are worshiping online and most of our announcements are all digital and going to email. So the first one to that note is we hope that all of you will add cbc at calvarydenver.org to your email contacts or your address book. This will allow all of our e-news communications to reach your inbox instead of spam or trash and it will allow you to know what's going on in our community during these times. As we worship today, we invite you and those you are worshiping with to take a selfie and post it to our Facebook page in the comments section or send it to Pastor Alice. This allows us to see each other as we worship and a wonderful way to celebrate, especially on this Easter Sunday. Midweek, we are still keeping with our midweek Wednesday gatherings. These are via Zoom. It's a great way to check in and be able to see how folks are doing, as well as hear from one of our Sunday school or Bible study leaders. 
Please note that in the eNews, there are ways to connect to that particular meeting and that a password is required to be able to enter that particular gathering. So be sure to take note of that and join us on Wednesday at 630. And we are excited for our time together, even if it continues to be virtually this Wednesday. As we consider ways to help those who are within our community, one of the ways we can do that is by helping Family Promise during our host week. Now, we may not be hosting here at Calvary the way we usually would, so please note that we are hoping to raise $2,500 to be able to help families um, who are sheltering with Family Promise be able to stay in a motel during our host week because they can't be at the church. Uh, it is a way for them to shelter in place. So the way you can do that is go to calvarydenver.org and go to our giving page. And from the giving page, you are able to select how you'd like to give and you can select other. And then in the memo line that will appear, you can put um, host week or family promise in the memo line. Thank you so much for your help as we seek to continue to be good hosts to our families um, who are sheltering with family promise on our host week. Another thing, we've been asking for bootstraps and blessing items, and we are so thankful to all of you who have helped us trying to reach our bootstraps and blessing clients and guests during this time where we are closed for typical business. Um, unfortunately, that has not been working the way we have had envisioned or had hoped to. Um, so we are pulling the bags for the time being, and we are looking at other ways that we are able to help those experiencing homelessness, and we appreciate all the donations you have already given and would ask you to consider shifting to supporting Jewish Family Service as they are continuing to meet needs and their food bank is getting busier due to folks um, needing it maybe for the first time. And you can give to Jewish Family Service um, or to Calvary, and we are able to give to JFS um, for their food pantry, which takes place Tuesdays through Fridays from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. And we are checking with some of their staff to see if there are other ways we can support them. But in the meantime, please note that we are so grateful for your donations to Bootstraps and Blessings, and we invite you to shift that generosity to Jewish Family Service. Calvary, as we prepare for worship, I invite you to offer Easter blessings to those around you, whether it's through um, the TV here, if you're worshiping at home alone, or if you have folks in your living room or kitchen, wherever you may be watching, offer Easter blessings. Christ has risen. He has risen indeed. Today we awaken to the dawn of a new day. We are called to be Easter people. We celebrate the good news of God's love. Darkness, Darkness cannot claim us. Fear cannot bind us. Illness and death cannot consume us. The empty tomb symbolizes the light shining in the darkness. The, the power of life over death. The power of hope over despair. The power of love over fear. And so we proclaim with joy. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Christ, Christ is, is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Alleluia. <laughs> <laughs>
and triumphs high. to worship. We are not eyewitnesses to an event as were Mary and the disciples. We have not journeyed through a dangerous city to seek answers or consolation. We have not seen angels gathering at the rim of this day or wept in the garden this morning because we could not find him. But we are here to attest to a story that has not lost its power during 20 centuries of change and conflict, problems and pandemics. We are here because those before us carried this story as if it were precious gold, cherished it as if it were the key to a hidden wisdom. Sisters and brothers in Christ, take your places here today in celebration and in awe. What you are about to hear again has the capacity to change the world. Your very presence attests to the rising up of life from the tomb of despair and to the uncontrollable power of God. It is Easter morning again, the stone has been rolled away, and we will celebrate. Battling 
you guys. Happy Easter. So if your kids aren't already in the room, go ahead and send them in. Um, to begin, I wanted to show you the cookies that we made from the recipes that I sent out a couple days ago. If you were able to make them great, go ahead and grab them and you can munch on them through the story. If you'd like the recipe, just send me an email. I'll happily send one out to you. These cookies are called Easter Surprise Cookies because in the middle of them, there's a jelly bean. So the story we're going to talk about today is also an Easter surprise, but it isn't about finding something we didn't expect to find, like a jelly bean and a cookie. It's about not finding what we expected. Now to actively participate in this story, every time I say Jesus, feel free to say he is risen. So on the Sunday after Jesus was crucified on the cross, two women went to visit the tomb where Jesus had been buried. When they arrived, the stone had covered the tomb, had rolled away, and an angel was sitting on it. The two women were shocked and they were scared. Don't be afraid, the angel said to them. I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's not here. He has risen just as he had said. Now, come see the place where he lay. Then go quickly to tell his disciples. The two women looked and saw that the tomb was empty and they hurried away. They were surprised. They were scared, but they were filled with joy. As they ran to the disciples, they met Jesus. They ran to him, they hugged him, and they worshiped him. Jesus said to them, don't be afraid. Go tell my brothers to leave for Galilee and they will see me there. Now that's what I call an Easter surprise. They went to see Jesus in the tomb, but he was not there. He was risen. So when we see our friends on Easter, we greet them by saying, he is risen. And our friends respond back with, he is risen indeed. Can you guys pray with me? Dear God, we thank you for this glorious celebration of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus. We are not surprised that the tomb was empty. He has risen just as he said. In his name we pray. Amen. Calvary, do you remember last fall how we all put our hands together and said, I'm in? I'm invited by God to participate in the work of Christ in the world. I'm inspired by meaningful worship and Bible study to live more fully. I'm involved in the community and church by volunteering and serving others. And I'm invested in Christ's mission through Calvary by giving financially. We asked one another, are you all in? I hope your answer is still yes. Even as we find ourselves in this unprecedented and difficult time of social distancing and quarantine, as we do our part in this pandemic to prevent the spread of COVID-19. Throughout the month of April, we are reviving this theme of saying I'm in by emphasizing how we are responding to the pandemic. We're calling it Calvary in response. We are inside abiding by stay at home and shelter in place orders, experiencing virtual worship, just as you are now. And yet, even as we are inside, we are very much in touch through weekly Zoom calls and 22 care teams that are calling, emailing, writing, and texting our membership to check in. Calvary, you are being the church with and for one another, even as our church building remains closed. Thank you. This week, we are highlighting how we are still involved in our community and why that means we are still very much in need of your financial gifts. We're working with Family Promise to house families experiencing homelessness in a unique way that looks different than our normal host week at the church. Instead of housing them at Calvary, we are paying for the motel fees for three families for seven nights, their weekly breakfast and lunch supplies and gift cards for their dinners each night. We're also seeking ways to get food and immediate resources to those in our Calvary neighborhood. We were doing that by setting out to-go food bags as a modified version of our weekly Bootstraps and Blessings ministry, but we're now turning our efforts to how we can support local agencies like Jewish Family Service and others who remain open and in operation during this time. We're also providing financial support to families in our own church 
who are experiencing financial difficulty because of job loss or furlough. And we continue to pay our hourly and contract workers during this time as their opportunities for employment have almost vanished right now. Think of nursery workers, sound techs, cleaning company, etc. For all these ways that we are involved in the community as we seek to join others in response to COVID-19, we are in need of your financial gifts. Your Easter gift today will go a long way in ensuring that our ministry continues with strength and purpose in these uncertain and difficult times. Remember, with our building being closed, we have significantly lower building rental income. So your gifts, while already essential, are now even more so. The next two weeks in April, we'll see how we remain a people in faith and in unity. And of course, today, on this day, we remember that we are forever a people in hope. God calls us out of the tomb of our present experience to see the needs beyond us and all around us. So while I know that some of you are struggling financially and cannot give right now, for those of us who can, may we give this Easter Sunday in hope and in response to all the ways that we are involved in our community. We are indeed in need. And your giving and my giving helps us meet Calvary's needs in significant ways. We're hoping to spread the message of Calvary's mission far and wide this Easter season. Make sure to share our social media posts with your friends and family. And at the end of the month, we'll count up just how many people gave in response to this effort and we'll celebrate each gift. It's not the amount of the donation that matters. All gifts are welcome. It's rather the number of people participating that will show the contagion of our generosity. Calvary Giving Online on your tablet or computer is easy. Just go to calvarydenver.org slash give. It brings you to our give page. Click the box that says click here for online giving. And when you get to the give page, you'll go to giving type and you'll choose Calvary in response. Calvary giving on your smartphone by text message is easy. Open your text messages, start a new message, and you're going to text open to all, that's the word open, the numeral two, and the word all, to 77977. Click send, and shortly you'll receive a response that prompts you to go to our give page or give by mailing a check to Calvary Baptist Church of Denver, 6500 East Girard Avenue, Denver, Colorado, 80224. Our mail is being held at the local post office, so it is safe, and we're picking it up each week. Calvary, on this day where we celebrate the resurrection of our incarnate God in Christ, please join Damon and me in giving in response and in hope. Gente ben que dizes que que bom de Gente ben que dizes que que bom de
Happy Easter, Calvary! I hope you have uh, felt a bit of Easter joy in your own home today. Uh, I have some flowers here and a happy Easter balloon, and I am feeling the joy of the risen Christ this morning. I have the privilege of giving you our Easter prayer. Uh, I am looking at our prayer list, which is linked in our e-news, which you're welcome to take a look at. Now, please join me in prayer. Risen God, death-defying God, God of victory, we come to you this morning. Gracious God, we must admit that there were times in this week where it did not feel like Easter was coming at all. And we are all in different places some of us feel that joy this morning, and some of us cannot. But you welcome us just where we are. That is the beauty of the resurrected Christ. Lord God, we want to just thank you for giving us this opportunity to worship together. Something we do not take for granted, and we praise you and thank you for making it possible. Lord God, we thank you for the flowers and the springtime, even though it may be snowing on this Easter Sunday, we still feel the beauty and marvel at how life begins anew. Seeing the blooming flowers, the singing birds, it all reminds us that you are a God of renewal. You are a God that is working even when we don't see it. And like seeds in the ground, you are there slowly working and growing to produce something beautiful. Thank you for that resurrection spirit. Lord God, I petition and ask you today that you help us to feel that this morning. That you help us to to know that we can be Easter people, even in darkness. That we can feel the joy of Easter, even without sunshine. Lord God, there are so many on our prayer list that we lift up to you today. Lord God, this list is overwhelming, we must admit. But we know that nothing is too much for you, O oh God. You hold all the prayers of the world in your hands, and you hear every single one. You cry when we cry, and you rejoice with us when we rejoice. So though this list may seem long, nothing is too much for you, O oh God. Lord God, we specifically lift up the family of Sam Baldridge, who passed away from COVID-19 this past week. Lord God, we lift up the family of Morgan Fletcher, who lost her great uncle Bob this past week. Lord God, we lift up Lyle Baumgartner, who is in hospice care this week, and we lift up Judy, and we praise you and thank you that she is able to visit with him. We lift up Cody Postel, who has symptoms of COVID-19. Give him strength, give him perseverance, give him the assurance that one day this will end. Lord God, we lift up friends and family of Calvary members who have been afflicted with COVID-19. The list is growing longer, O oh God, and we are not sure when it will start to stop. But we know that you are with us. You are with us when we fear the worst. And you are assuring us that you are there right next to us, as close as our breath. Lord God, we specifically lift up Milton Thomas son-in-law of Early Delhi, 
hospitalized in the ICU with COVID-19. Be with him and his family, O oh God. We lift up Les Redifer, who is coping with a detached retina. Be with Les and Patty, O oh God. And Lord, we lift up our chaplains, our nurses, our doctors, our healthcare workers, our grocery store workers, all of those who are on the front lines in this pandemic. Keep them safe, O oh God. Give them strength when they feel like they have none left. Reassure them that you are working through them, that their gifts are God-given to help people in this time. Lord God, just enable us to live each day knowing that your mercies are new every morning, knowing that your love never fails. And even though we don't know how this pandemic will be, we don't know the outcome, we don't know when it will end, help us to take each faithful step together. Help us to show your love, your kindness, your compassion. Help us to know how to live out the gospel where we are right now. Lord God, you know every prayer request that is unspoken. We lift those up to you now. Lord God, we praise you and thank you for this Easter morning. We thank you that we are still able to celebrate virtually together. And now we pray that ancient, comforting prayer. Let's pray it together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. From the buried grave, wheat that in dark earth many days has laid, love lives again that with the dead has been. Love is come again like wheat that springeth green. In the grave they laid him, love whom hate had slain, thinking that never would wake again, laid in the earth like grain that sleeps unseen. Love is come again like wheat that springeth green. For he came at Easter like the risen grain, he that for three days in the grave had laid, quick from the dead my risen Lord is seen. Love is come again like wheat that springeth green. When our hearts are wintry, grieving or in pain, thy touch can call us back to life again. Fields of our hearts a dead and bare have been. Love is come again like Wheat that springeth green. A reading from Mark chapter 16, verses 1 through 8. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and Salome bought spices 
so that they might go and anoint Jesus. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he has told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. most unusual worship service that I've ever experienced. And as much as I love our home, this is not where I want to be today. I want to be with you, Calvary, and with the rest of the Christian world around the globe gathering together. I want to celebrate the risen Christ with my people, because you are the ones who teach me who the risen Christ is and what he looks like in the world. It's the stories behind your faces on Easter morning that tell me everything I need to know about resurrection and hope. That through the grief of your losses, through the trials of your cancer treatments, through the pain of your broken relationships and job losses, through the disappointments of life just not turning out as we planned, through our lament of ongoing injustices and inequities, it is through all of that that we stand together on Easter morning and say, Christ is risen. And the power in our collective Easter proclamation is what has always made Easter feel like Easter to me. As a 19th century clergyman, Phillips Brooks said, let us not say merely Christ is risen, but I shall rise, we shall rise. And this is what I feel on Easter when we gather in the sanctuary with the light streaming in from the windows and the lilies brightening the chancel as we process down the aisle with the Christ candle, as we sing the hallelujah chorus, I feel the spirit of God rising up in us together. But here we are, separated, not in our sanctuary, but in our individual homes. And perhaps we wonder today what it means for us to be a people who proclaim Christ is risen if we don't have a chorus of folks with an earshot to echo back, he is risen indeed. What does Easter mean for us today, this year? It's a much quieter day, isn't it? A much more unsure and uncertain day. Well, as we seek to proclaim resurrection hope in the midst of a global pandemic that marches forward with full force, as each day brings mounting statistics of death and disease, we're reminded by Mark's gospel that on that first Easter morning, the air was thick with death and hearts were heavy with dis-ease. If we have to experience Easter morning in the middle of a pandemic, then Mark's gospel is where we want to be. Mark meets us where we are. 
Or maybe Mark reminds us that where we usually are on Easter morning, gathered in celebration in our adorned sanctuaries, is nothing like where the women at the tomb were. Maybe this year we can actually meet the women where they are and see the empty tomb from their perspective. Maybe this Easter will teach us something about the mystery of the resurrection that we've never known before, that it was surprising and confusing. It was not an immediate cause for celebration. Rather, what it caused was a pause, a, a hesitation, a stepping back before a moving forward. Mark writes, when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And as these three women approached the tomb, they wonder aloud to each other, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? You see, in Mark chapter 15, verse 47, we learn that Mary Magdalene was actually there when Joseph of Arimathea rolled the big heavy stone in front of the tomb in the first place. So she knew from her own two eyes the barrier that lay before them. Who will roll away the stone for us is a genuine, well-founded concern and worry. And yet, it's not a strong enough fear to prevent them from going to the tomb. It's not like they stay at home in bed that morning thinking, well, we might as well not even go to the tomb because that huge stone is there. What's the use? No, they're not, they're not pessimistic that they hold this roadblock before them, this barrier. It's not an excuse to not make the journey to Jesus' body, but they do voice aloud this unanswerable, genuine concern, who will roll away the stone? It reminds me of when you're on a road trip and you come across some construction and traffic is all backed up and somebody in the car voices an obvious question like, I wonder how long this construction is going to last, right? How many miles long is it? Of course, no one in your car knows how long it's going to take you to get through the construction and the congested traffic, but you ask that question out loud anyway as a way of processing the situation. You keep moving forward, inching along in traffic, even as you continue to wonder, when is this going to clear up, right? How late is this going to make us? Well, in the same vein, these women are wondering aloud together, knowing good and well that none of them can answer the question, who will roll away the stone for us? But even as they ask it, just like the car inching forward in congested traffic, they keep going, putting one foot in front of the other. They keep walking toward the tomb. Their question, their concern, it does not keep them from going to find Jesus. And it's a real concern in their minds. It's a real barrier that they know they will have to face once they get there, but it doesn't keep them from getting up and going nonetheless. And I wonder how many of us would have had the faith that these women did to get up and to go to Jesus' tomb that morning even if we knew that a huge stone would be blocking us. Of course, hindsight is twenty twenty. We know now that their fear would be unfounded, but they had no way of knowing that at the time. How many times do we limit what is possible because of the huge, insurmountable stone we think is in our way? How many times do we let perceived barriers, no matter how well-founded our fears or knowledge about those barriers are, how many times do we let perceived barriers keep us from getting up and moving forward? How many times do we let doubts and questions, anger, fear, vulnerabilities keep us from moving toward Jesus? You see, in Mark's Gospel, I think the first act of Easter faith is that these three women get up and move toward Jesus even though they thought something huge might be blocking them, something beyond what they could move on their own. 
And I'll remind you that in Jesus' day, tombs were almost more like caves hewn into the side of mountains, right? So we're not talking about a small boulder here. We are talking about a life-size stone, a stone not easily rolled away. And these women, they know their own strength, their limitations, and this is why they're wondering, we're going to need someone to help us move this. Who will roll away the stone for us? But here is where the mystery of Easter morning begins, my friends. Here is where we see the power of the resurrection already at play. Because Mark tells us that when the women arrive at Jesus' tomb, and when they look up, they see that the stone, which indeed was very large, had already been rolled back. You know, we can remain stuck sometimes in faith and in life because we think we are stuck. When the truth is the stone has been rolled away, but we just haven't looked up long enough to see that it's gone. Now, for these women, indeed, it's a mystery as to how the stone has been removed. We're not told directly how it happened, but we get the feeling that it was God, don't we? That God has rolled away the stone in front of the tomb and out of the place of death has come new life. Of course, the women don't know about the new life part just yet. They just know that the place of death they have come to is different than how they imagined or anticipated it to be. Their fear was not unfounded. They were not incorrect about there being a huge stone at Jesus' tomb. The stone was there. The barrier was there. Their worry was real. But their limited perspective was not the full picture. Where they saw their own limitations, they couldn't imagine at that time God's ability to roll away the stone for them. Who could have known? right? None of us. These women could not have known that God would roll away the stone from the tomb of Jesus. And again, I wonder how many times do we keep ourselves from moving forward in life, from taking a step out in faith, from believing that something that seems impossible might be possible, because we are focused on the stone that is in our way, the stone that we think might be blocking us when the reality is God has rolled that stone away already. God has opened the place that we thought was closed. What we thought was sealed forever and a done deal, God has undone and unsealed and set free. So when we feel stuck between a rock and a hard place, sure, God may not just magically whisk us out of that hard place. But God may just move that rock to help shift our perspective so that we see things a bit differently. God rolls away stones so that we don't stay stuck. The stone was rolled away for Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, and the stone has been rolled away for you and me. And you know what? We don't have to know all the details of how it happened or why it happened. We just have to look up and see that the stone is gone. The mystery of the risen Christ has never been about what we can intellectually understand or comprehend. It's about what we can spiritually see and how that sight moves us forward in faith. The rolling stone just allows us to keep rolling in our lives. Seeing that the stone has been rolled away allows the women to take their next step in faith. And you know what that step is? Is that they step into the tomb, the place of death. And when they step into the tomb, they discover it is not what they thought it was either. It is not a grave. In fact, it is a gateway to the rest of their lives. You see, when God rolls away stones in our lives, when God removes the things that we think are barriers, God does not leave us hanging. When barriers are brought down, when stones are rolled away, God meets us in those places with messages. And on that Easter morning, Mark tells us that God meets these women with an actual messenger, a man dressed in white. Who knows how long he had been sitting there? Maybe five minutes, maybe five hours, 
Maybe he just showed up when they walked through the tomb because that's when he was needed. What's important is not how long the messenger had been waiting there, but that he was there waiting. God, thank goodness, is very comfortable with waiting. When God wants to get a message to us, I don't think there is a timeline where the clock is counting down and we're going to miss the message if we don't act fast enough. When the stone is rolled away, the message will be there for us, I believe, as it was for these women, whenever we look up, no matter how long it takes for us to get there. On this day, the messenger says to the women, don't be alarmed. I know you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. But go tell the disciples he's going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. You were looking for what you expected to find, and that's not here. Instead, I'm pointing you toward what God wants you to find. What God wants you to find is not a tomb. It's not in a grave. What God wants you to find is out in the world, in Galilee, out ahead of you. It is gone before you. It is leading the way. It is the risen Christ. And so do what you know to do. Follow God out of this grave and back into the world where God has always been. Look for Jesus in Galilee, where he said he would be. His place of ministry, his place where all the people are, the place of transformation. This is where he will meet you. Trust what you've been told. Jesus is not here in a tomb. He is out in the world. He is not dead. He is alive. He is not lying down. He is raised up. And it is no wonder, isn't it, that Mark says, terror and amazement seized the women and they were afraid and they didn't tell anyone a thing. Hearing the good news, especially hearing it in a grave, doesn't mean we are all of a sudden ready to get up and go. All the sorrow and the suffering of the week before, the, the mystery and the grief and the anxiety and worry of, of those moments as the women were walking to the tomb, those are not magically erased just because they're greeted by a heavenly messenger. I mean, I don't know about you, but most messages from God take a long time for me to discern and understand. Even when I discover that a stone is rolled away where I thought a stone would surely be blocking my way, even when that happens, the way forward is not always clear. And even if it is clear, I'm not always ready to take that step. And what I love about Mark's Easter account is that even as dawn breaks, the women still walk in darkness for a while. They don't say anything to anyone. They're afraid. A rolled away stone, an empty tomb, a heavenly messenger, a word of where to go and who's going to meet you there, all of that is good news. And yet, and yet, when the women hear that good news, they are not quite ready to immediately understand it or act upon it, and that's okay. Easter morning isn't a one-time shot. It's not a take-it-or-leave-it proposition. It is the opportunity of a lifetime, I believe, but it doesn't just come once. God is always rolling away the stone, always inviting us into the grave to discover instead a gateway to life. And it's okay if we're slow to take it all in. Death doesn't just disappear just because resurrection is a reality. In fact, it is the very reality of death that makes resurrection possible. And with all death, of course, there's going to be grief and uncertainty. And that will linger. These emotions don't go away quickly, but we don't have to linger alone. The beauty of the good news in this text is that the women are told that Jesus has gone ahead of them to Galilee. They know where to find them, and when they are ready, they will go. And you know what? We know that one day, they're ready, right? They do make it to Jesus in Galilee. One day, they do proclaim his resurrection far and wide. Otherwise, you and I wouldn't be here sitting today telling this good news story. And I think most of us, especially right now, 
can understand the emotions of these women. They go to the tomb to look for Jesus, to look for their Lord, and they're told that they're not going to find who they're looking for. Instead, they're given a message that calls them beyond the reality of the tomb into a future that they cannot yet see. And yet that they are called to move into by faith anyway. Sound familiar? A future we cannot see, but we are called to move into in faith anyway? You see, for these women, the emotional reality of this morning remains confusing. Terror and amazement seize them. It is not a morning of celebration for them. It's a moment, perhaps, of curiosity. It's not a morning of public proclamation for them. It's a, a moment of private perspective shifting. It is not a morning of hallelujahs. It's a moment of holy whispers. It is their Easter morning. And maybe it is ours this year, too. What does it mean to celebrate Easter in the midst of a pandemic? <laughs> it means that we're speaking into video cameras, trusting that we are able to communicate with people whom we cannot see about a Christ whom we cannot see, even as we proclaim a message that we trust is pointing us beyond this moment into God's ultimate purpose, which is life. Life anew, life as we've never known it before. Life that no longer caters to death. In this season of COVID-19, instead of waking up to see what the death statistics are each day, maybe in this season of Eastertide, we are called to wake up and see what the signs of resurrection are because they're all around us. The way forward is not around death, not denying it or avoiding it, but it is through it. Mark reminds us this Easter morning that the way forward beyond this day, this moment, it may not be something we can yet see, but whatever the way forward is, Jesus is already there, waiting. Jesus is in Galilee, his place of ministry and life and transformation, and he will meet us there whenever we can get there, whenever we arrive. Jurgen Moltmann, the theologian, says that hope is not about what's going to happen to us as much as it is about who will be waiting for us. As we move through this time of fear and worry and suffering and uncertainty, are we able to move forward and trust that we will find Jesus waiting for us. Will we actually take steps of faith to find Jesus? Will we search for his presence as the risen Christ in the world around us? Well, it feels like in this time that stone after stone is being rolled into our way, blocking our existence as we know it. And while it may feel like we live in a world of stagnant systems and stacking statistics, it is also true that we live in a world of rolling stones. The good news of Easter morning is that we do not have to live in a stagnant, stuck reality because God is rolling away stones each and every morning. God rolled away a stone on that first Easter morning and God is rolling away stones each and every day in our lives too. So will we hunker down in fear because we think something might be blocking our way? Or will we join with the women in Mark's gospel in making our way to what we think is a grave of death to perhaps discover that it's really a gateway to life? As the British rock band, the Rolling Stones, sang, you can't always get what you want, but if you try, Sometimes, well, you just might find you get what you need. Ironically, the women at the tomb in Mark's gospel, they don't find what they want. They don't find someone there to roll away the stone for them. They do, however, find what they need, that the stone's already been rolled away. And they found what they needed because they didn't hesitate to take a step in faith. If nothing else, in this time of pandemic, Easter morning reminds us that no 
We're not always going to get what we want, but God knows what we need. As we stand in a tomb, looking for death, Jesus stands in a town, experiencing new life. From the grave all the way to Galilee, God keeps rolling away stones. So my friends, if you feel boxed in this morning, if you feel a little less Easter joy today, if you are experiencing sorrow or grief or death, know that you are not alone. You are in good company. Maybe this year we're experiencing the resurrection as it was first experienced, as something that is so surprising that it stuns us into silence before it ever spurs us into celebration. Maybe this year, we join the women in walking away from the tomb a little more awestruck, wondering a bit more deeply about what this all means. Maybe, instead of shouting hope into the world, we allow hope to gradually dawn on us, calling us to look up out of our darkness one stone's roll at a time. Amen. Calvary, as we come to this hymn of response, I invite you to listen for the ways that the risen Christ is at work in your life. The same invitation that I offer when we're all gathered together, I offer to you today. If you would like to make a profession of faith in Christ, or if you're looking for a community with which to journey through life, Calvary is a wonderful place to do so, and we would love to have you join us as a member. If you'd like to talk about faith or church membership or anything else, know that you can call the church and speak with me. For all of us this morning as we sing, may we see and listen for the ways that Christ is working in our lives today. Christ, 
no strings attached, and be inspired by the fellowship of the Holy Spirit that is alive and at work in your life and in our world. Hallelujah. Amen.